Hello, everyone, and welcome to Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Direction this week. Uh, it's Justin Nielsen here, your host, and it's November 30th, 2022. And uh, we've got a great show for you. Usually, Arusha Pierce would be joining me as my weekly special guest, but uh, his his voice is shot today. So he's, he's taking a sick day, um, which is probably good because he would probably be gloating about how well USC beat Notre Dame. And no one really needs to hear that. So kind of kind of better that he's not here. But what we do have is we have Jared Blickery from Yahoo Finance. He's a global markets reporter there. And usually he's on the other side of the interviewers table. So Jared, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and being rather than the host being the one that is going to be interviewed. Pleasure yeah. to have you. The tables are turned. I'm really grateful to be here and to be able to speak to your audience. Uh, both you and Irusha have been on the Yahoo Finance Network. So reciprocation is uh, great. <laughs> right, exactly. It's what makes society works, right? Yes. Uh, so, of course, today what we're going to talk about a little bit, we'll get into the markets. We'll probably get into some of Powell's comments and uh, the, the move that happened after that. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about what Jared calls transcend transcendental investing. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well as some of the stocks that are on Jared's radar. But Jared, since again, maybe people aren't as familiar with your background because uh, you're usually asking the questions, let's start with some questions about you. Like, how'd you get started in, in markets? And uh, uh, what, what do you find are the most important lessons that you've learned along the way? Well, my, I, I touched on markets really early in my working career. When I was about 18 years old, I found myself working for a securities lawyer. And uh, the securities lawyer actually worked in the futures industry in and around Chicago for a number of years. I grew up in Miami. And uh, if you've ever been to Miami, it's, uh, it's an interesting place. Kind of earns its reputations as a, a Florida city with a twist. Um, so not a lot of investment activity going down there, but it is big in commodities, certain commodities. Mm. Um, you know, you, you take a look at coffee in Brazil and Colombia and the whole lot. So I, I, got, a, I got an education in markets firsthand from that. Uh, didn't really do much or any trading, though, until the mid 2000s. I'd say 2005, I started got, getting really interested in it. I had gotten my computer science degree from school and it hadn't really done much coding, but it seemed like a natural fit. I loved analyzing markets and I started programming indicators to help me visualize the market, mm. ended up writing uh, different strategies to trade portfolios. And I never really became an automated uh, trader. I didn't, uh, I, it was more along the lines of trying to write tools and build tools to help me see the market. And that's why I like the, uh, the visualization, but uh, just about I, I would say I got kind of serious about it in 2007. And this was the lead up to the global financial crisis. <laughs> right. There were cracks showing all over the place. And I just wanted to know what's going on because as traders, we only have to know about the instruments that we're actually trading. Trading At the time I got started in grains, but ended up in the financial futures. Futures are highly leveraged. They trade much, much differently than right. stocks. Indices trade differently than individual stocks. So it was a different world. Uh, but I got I educated myself and with the help of some other people, I just started writing. And as I write, as I wrote this daily newsletter back in early 2008, kicked it off the ground, um, didn't know where it was going. Uh, I got some clarity and I started being able to put some pieces together, I thought. And then I got picked up by some alternative media outlets and eventually, um, you know, fast forward a number of years, ended up at Yahoo Finance in 2015. And that's where I really got my education in stocks. Um, uh, I had come to appreciate them through some prior efforts. I was part of a trading group where I, I met firsthand some really great Canslim traders. And what impressed me about them was their discipline and how they had a, a method and they stuck to it. And that's basically the school that I came from. We were trading totally different things, but um, I, I learned a lot from them. So when I came to Yahoo Finance, I started learning more about the stories behind a lot of these tickers yeah. uh, that we watch and listen and, and talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. And it wasn't until last year, 2021, that I actually started trading stocks for the first time. It took GameStop and Reddit to kind of lure <laughs> me in and okay. I, I was lucky at the time because when I decided I wanted to start trading stocks, that was after a huge sell off in March of that year. I remember buying Tesla and Apple at the lows um, and I never got into the meme stocks. I would traded crypto a little bit, but ended up outperforming the S&P 500. 
that year uh, had some nice returns and it was a good year for the S&P 500. And this year um, I have not done nearly as well. And I'm still yeah. trying to figure out my own trading style. And um, I've, I've, I originally started as a day trader that was decades ago and I don't have the time to do that. So I'm more of a swing trader now. And okay. I like hitting for the fences. I like trading the indices or ETFs and kind of going for long shots when I feel the deck is stacked in my favor rather than necessarily trading individual names, but I still hold a few of those too. So mm -hmm. bottom line, I've been experimenting with options and some different trading styles, but key to this is I have been a study, a student of charts and of markets for a long time. So I do, I think I have some, I think I have some chart reading abilities that might, uh, that might give some of your viewers some uh, ideas and also the approach to markets. I think whether, whatever you're trading, you have to have a certain amount of humility and the habits and practices that we set up uh, really guide us, and th those are key to our performance. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned a little bit about this, uh, you know, the indicators that you were programming. You know, you didn't do much coding with your computer science degree, but you did a little bit, and it was really to kind of get some indicators and some visualization of what's happening exactly. Uh, do, do you have some preferences of indicators that you use or ways to visualize? Because um, I know, I mean, you know, everyone has kind of their favorite, whether it's candlesticks, point figure, um, you know, just the simple, you know, high, low close. What, what, what do you kind of gravitate towards? Yeah, this is going to get into our discussion of uh, my approach to uh, investments and what you were calling, what I called, and you were just talking about the transcendental, uh, I guess, philosophical approach. Basically, it's keep it simple. You know, okay. um, I look at candlestick charts. That's what I really rely on. I, I drill down from the monthlies to the weeklies to the dailies. And just having thousands of hours of screen time looking at these candlesticks evolve in real time, a lot of it intraday, um, I think you develop a, a, a feel for the markets and a feel for where the overhead supply is and for where the, the demand is below the market. And you can just see the levels. But to aid that analysis, I also like to use a volume profile. That's where you have you know, a histogram that shows these horizontal volume levels right. uh, transposed uh, across the price level. So you can really see where that market action is concentrated. Um, I've dabbled with um, the uh, Stoudemire's uh, charts back in the day and how those translate into um, into uh, into volume charts based on some of you know how that Stottlemyre was in the 80s it's evolved since then but basically the volume profile is something I've looked at VWAP and also anchored VWAP um, mm -hmm. this is something I don't know if you're familiar with Brian Shannon he's a no, Brian Shannon well he's been on the podcast a number of times excellent <laughs> um, he has just finished and is publishing a book all about anchored VWAP uh, you right. might know about it and I learned about it as I was learning about a very similar method uh, that was from the mid 1990s called the Midas method. Basically, um, you know, you're trying to, I think, figure out where investors' uncle point is, where their point of pain uh -huh. is. And if you can, whether you're looking at a 200 day moving average or you're looking at VWAP anchored to an important high or low, you want to find out where these equilibrium prices are because investors tend to make the same mistakes based on fear and greed in all kinds of markets. So we, if you can find those delicate inflection points, those potential uh, pivot points, those might be reflected by candlesticks. They might be Fibonacci levels, which I also pay attention to in day trading. A lot of times you just see things converge. And when you have that convergence, um, you, sometimes you get an obvious answer. OK, here's where things should happen. And if they don't, I know I need to be out. So. I'm looking for the deck to get stacked in my favor, and I like going in leverage because I come from the futures industry, and right. uh, I like these short hits in and out. Mm -hmm. So, you you mentioned a lot of indicators here, and I guess one of the one of the tricks is if you have too many indicators, you can get a lot of noise, a lot of contradictions with your indicators. Um, so, how do you kind of rely on? Okay, the, these are the ones that are important. These are the ones that are maybe not so important. And what do you do when you start getting some contradictory signals? Well, if I'm if I'm a, putting them on my day trader hat, and I haven't done that in a, in a long time. I'm going to be looking at some different things, and not to con not to confuse everybody with uh, vastly different styles. I'm going to be talking about how I'm approaching uh, trading stocks right now. So, on a typical stock, let's say I'm looking at a daily candlestick chart. I will have RSI at the bottom with the standard 14 period look back because that's a standard. And I, I wanna be looking at what most other people are looking at. 
I'm looking at moving averages, the 200 day, the 50 day, the 20 day. I'm looking at when they cross over because those are, those are the things that generate headlines. Those are the things that activate stock, activate stock filters. And again, are bringing to the forefront uh, those tickers that people at least theoretically should be looking at. Uh, what else? So besides moving averages, RSI, um, not looking at volume too much on an absolute basis, but on a relative basis. So I mentioned okay. volume at price. So if I'm right. if I see a bunch of congestion in a market and I want to know, OK, is the volume up here? Or is it down here? I'll, I'll overlay that on price. But usually everything I want to know about a market is revealed in a simple candlestick chart with some very basic indicators can get a little bit more fancy. But I don't think you have to. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go ahead and switch over and uh, maybe test some of your your charting skills and 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 your knowledge here. And we'll just yeah. we'll just go with some simple market smith charts. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, let's say the Dow Jones uh, Industrial Average, and we can chat a little bit about the market. Uh, certainly, what we saw today was a very very powerful day. I mean, the the Dow Jones Industrial Average it was one of the lagging indexes because it was only up a mere two two point two percent. You know, and this is certainly been one of the stronger indexes lately um what's what's your take on what's happening with the market right now i mean certainly the dow looks very different from let's say the nasdaq yeah the nasdaq uh still mired if we were to use the same time frame here it would be in the bottom end of its range probably the bottom quarter uh, I think this illustrates a huge current shift that we're seeing in the market right now in terms of the macro picture. And uh, traders are aware of this. Uh, I'm sure you guys talk a lot about uh, the changing tides here, but the era of free money, that is pretty yeah. much in the past. Uh, Wednesday, a huge day. I was writing our markets newsletter, our morning brief markets newsletter, had to change directions after Powell took the stage at 1.30 because single-handedly, by not revealing a whole lot of anything brand new, we got the second best rally of the month. And then to boot, the Dow is up 20% off of its lows now. So you know what that's uh, what headlines that's generating. Oh, new bull market in the Dow. Does right. it matter to us as traders? Probably not. But you know, you think about it from the context of what people are seeing on the evening news, well, that headline might make it. That might shift investor sentiment. So, you know, the Dow is an interesting index. It's only 30 stocks. We could talk about that all day, but I think it's still relevant. It mm -hmm. is the people's index. And that's what we're looking at right now. You can also see here in the chart, it is now taking out its August highs. And um, I'm not sure where the transports are right now, but uh, transports had been lagging a little bit. If you pay attention to Dow theory, um, I mean, there are all kinds of di different directions you can go with this. There you go. So you got the the trans the Dow transports poking above the 200 day moving average, but lagging the industrials a mm -hmm. bit. So um, I, I think uh, just in terms of getting back to your original question, there is a change in macro headwinds. The era of free money is over. The new winners are not going to look like the winners of the previous 14 years, basically, we had a huge, huge leadership change since the global financial crisis. And we're going to be in an era of higher interest rates and higher inflation for a while. Even I expect inflation to come down and the Fed to pivot next year and all that good stuff. But this is probably the beginning of a secular trend, I think, that will last throughout the decade. It's very rare that the Fed can just arbitrarily stamp out inflation with one fell swoop. We saw Volcker make many attempts at it in the early 80s. It took him two recessions. Powell has vowed not to make the same mistake as Volcker. I think that's key here. Now, what he's doing is trying to front load everything so he, has, he doesn't have to go back and right. have two recessions. He's comfortable with one, but not two. So I don't think we've seen the fallout from these 475 basis point rate hikes so far. And um, I think that's going to be a key uh, I think that's going to really weigh on markets in the first half of 2023, notwithstanding the fact that I think we get a Santa Claus rally into the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So getting back to kind of Powell's co comments, because I think it's really interesting because he is trying to really project, hey, the risk of doing too little is far greater than the risk of doing too much. I mean, he was very clear about that in the press conference, uh, you know, last last Fed meeting. Um, you know, and and as you said, he's he's really kind of uh, shown a lot of commitment to it. Now, granted, we've seen the Fed blink a number of times in the past, you know, when when the market's gotten uh, a little bit rougher. I mean, we saw that in 2018, for instance. Uh, but this time it seems like the Fed isn't blinking so much. So why do you think the market you know, rallied as much as it did when there really <laughs> wasn't anything new here? 
I, I think it's part of the old conditioning and also because of the time of year. Um, this is, it, you consider, let's say that you're a portfolio manager right now and you're underperforming the market. Well, you need to get in on something uh, potentially to take advantage of what usually statistically happens almost every year, and that is the Santa Claus rally. It doesn't have to happen, but you're probably going to go all in. What stocks are you going to buy? Well, you want to buy what's working recently, or you want to buy those downtrodden stocks, which are going to get a short covering rally. That, you know, the mega caps on Wednesday uh, really rallied hard, and this was on the back of Powell's slight, I'm not even going to call it a dovish statement. Um, as we've been talking about, there's nothing new there, but he did uh, hint that it's only going to be a 50 basis point rate, rate yeah. hike in, in December. Um, I think you have to understand and take into consideration what Powell, the man, what Powell, the person is thinking. Uh, he's talked about the, his comparison to Volcker, who is his personal hero in a lot of interviews, and he has avowed not to make the same mistake. So I don't think people should test his resolve. I think he's going to continue his path, but traders are going to do what traders do, and that is uh, they're going to be bid up anytime they see any kind of hint that the Fed might be thinking about thinking about pivoting, even if that doesn't come to pass. And like I said, given the bullish time of year, maybe that explains some of what's happened. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and switch over to the NASDAQ composite real quick. Just, you know, again, the Dow has obviously been the leader here. Uh, and as you mentioned, that comes with some problems, you know, being only 30 stocks, price weighted and everything. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how many times family members will say, you know, oh, the Dow did this. And I'm like, I, I, <laughs> I like, what? you know, they're, they're saying how many points it was up. I'm like, the Dow what? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I guess. But, <laughs> um, but let, let's talk about the NASDAQ, because certainly one of the things we saw uh, I mean, really, I mean, to, to many, the the bear market started really in February of 2021 when the big growth names, the 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 COVID plays like DocuSign and Zoom Video and uh, PayPal and, you know, Shopify and what have you started going down. Um, what's your take that growth has really suffered so much? And it seems like a lot of what's driven the NASDAQ lately has been the bottom fishing. Uh, some big gains in some of these really downtrodden stocks. Uh, do you do you see new leadership? Uh, you know, you, you kind of talked about a change here. Um, wh where do you see things going? Do you think the Nasdaq is going to be dead for a while and it's going to be more Dow S and P five hundred? Uh, what, what's your take? I think the Nasdaq could catch up a bit here, uh, just based on some of the, some of the dynamics we've talked about. But I think it's going to be a laggard for some time, echoing what happened twenty years ago with the dot com bust. And um, you look inside the components. So inside the NASDAQ 100, just because it's a little bit easier, at the November winners and really since the, the last rally took off in mid-October, it's China stocks. And that's mm -hmm. an entirely different topic. We can get to that. <laughs> Aside from that, um, a lot of the growth names not doing so well, but you have pockets of strength. You know, you take a look at the S&P 500 sectors, XLY, consumer discretionary, worst off of the month mainly dragged down by Amazon, Shopify, Wayfair, and some of those e-com retailers. Then you look on the opposite end of the spectrum of some of the brick and mortar retailers, especially the discounters, one of which we're going to get into in a few minutes. Well, it's a different story. And so I think it's reflecting new leadership. And in general, in this new market regime, which I see playing out over years uh, and the transition into it, I think uh, inflation concerns are going to be higher. Um, and there's just going to be a whole range of dynamics that people don't have that people are going to have to consider that they really didn't have to in the old environment. OK, since you brought it up, we've got to talk a little bit about China, because as yes. you mentioned, a lot of these Chinese stocks, um, they, they've been among those that were beaten down so much and have been having some of these you know, phenomenal rises. Uh, but of course, uh, to, to say that there's some headline risk is an understatement. Uh, I mean, it seems like it's been years now between the, the the trade wars that were going on under Trump to, you know, delisting fears. And, you know, I mean, now we've got, you know, protests going on. What what what's your take on China? Is this something that is uh, an opportunity here or just too dangerous? It's an opportunity to some. For me, just based on the way I like to control risk, it's not an opportunity for me. Having said that, I punted KWeb a couple times this year after I vowed not to. And what kept me in, in the no China stocks was looking at what happened with the Didi IPO. 
basically a day or two after they listed in the U.S., China put the brakes on and they killed equity investors. And if there's any doubt, as we've seen over the last two years, that Pre President Xi and the communist regime over there will protect their power at expense of everything else, including the markets, those, that can be a sacrificial lamb. I mean, the writing's on the wall here. If you're invested in these, you could wake up to a, a game changer any morning. Um, I'm all about risk. I like leverage, but I like to control the variables or have at least a sense that the variables and the entire uh, system itself, including the legal system, has some kind of viability and that the rules aren't going to be changed in the middle of the game. Uh, I think one of the greatest detriments that's happened, one of the worst things that happened to Western capital markets or exchanges in the last few years was what happened in London with um, the silver trades mm -hmm. going bust after the fact. And China's basically doing the same thing. If you're going to change the rules in the middle of the game or after the fact, I don't want to be trading with you. Having said that, um, what's going on there, really interesting. You can't deny uh, price action. Uh, yeah. and the leading stocks over the last month or two have definitely been centered in China. Well, when we come back, we're going to get a little bit more into the transcendental part of investing. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. Thanks so much. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Direction. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, and joining me on the show this week is Jared Blickery. He is a global markets reporter from Yahoo Finance. Uh, I've, I've been on a show a couple times. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the first times I think I was on your show was April 6, 2020. When we had a follow <laughs> big day. day. Uh, yeah, it was a big day. I was, I was uh, you know, still trying to work on my whole uh home office setup you know trying to get the video all and and then we had a follow-through day and it was it was just a a crazy time but let's go ahead and get into the more transcendental side and and when we were when we we're kind of having our pre-show we were talking about uh you know different different aspects of uh discipline i mean you mentioned that uh, you know that the, the discipline being important um you mentioned a little bit earlier the whole idea of keeping it simple keep it simple stupid you know so Describe that a little bit. Why, why do you feel like that's so important? I think there is so much information. There are so many platforms available. There are so many different indicators, so many strategies and schools of thought. Now, it's easy to get lost in the volume of content out there, most of which is not even that useful. Uh, we know I, I, I love IBD um, because there is a methodology to it, the canceling methodology. It's based on things that work. It's tried and true. And uh, the people running the business, Bill O'Neill himself, uh, is a stand-up guy. But elsewhere in the industry, you have a lot of snake oil salesmen. The best way to avoid all that nonsense um, is just to focus on what works. You don't need a bunch of black box stuff uh, to make money consistently in the market. And that's what we're that's what I think the goal should be is to make money consistently in the market. As we saw in 2021, those uh, quick shots, uh, fly in the pie, flash in the pan, GameStop, yeah. those trades have, you know, they come up from time to time. But people who get involved in those trades tend to execute the same strategy until it doesn't work. And then they execute that strategy until their bank accounts, which had swollen with profits possibly at one time are diminished. So keeping it simple, I look at price action. I love the candlestick charts. Tells me most of what I need to know without any indicators. I look at the mm -hmm. monthly, drill down to the weekly, daily, um, and then intraday from there. So in terms of indicators, most of them are going to be off the shelf. Um, moving averages, I look at the big ones because I want to know what other people are looking at. 200 yeah. day moving average, the 50, the 20. RSI with a 14 period look back, talked about volume profile a little bit before, anchored VWAP. Uh, another thing which I didn't discuss is rel uh, relative strength. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's um, for, anybody, for anybody who's not familiar with it, you can simply divide one security by another, a broader measure, and you come up with its own chart. And you can do technical analysis, analysis on that. So within um, 
candlesticks, I'll put trend lines on them. I'll use horizontal support and resistance. Uh, but really, most of my work is just focusing on the price action and learning to read those charts. Um, anybody who asks about volume, I look at relative volume in certain ways, but you know, I really don't trust the exchange. Uh, I really don't trust the volume that's broadcast by the exchanges. I come from the futures industry where it's just one centralized uh, dissemination. So I tend to trust that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So so why is it that you don't trust the volume? Let's let, well, because, let, let's, let's not leave that comment just out there. <laughs> Uh, just because you have so many, you have a fractured um, marketplace yeah. with so many different exchanges, you look at the total volume. So I will look at total volume in, uh, for instance, all New York Stock Exchange listed stocks, right. but only relative to maybe that 15 minute window going back 30 days in time, mm -hmm. or maybe this day as relative to the last 60 days. So on a relative basis, the daily fluctuations are meaningful, but absolute wise, um, not as important to me. Also, one of my pet peeves is people who apply the volume methodology of individual stocks to indices, and they don't trade the same way. You don't necessarily have to see increasing volume with increasing price in the uh, indices the way you might expect in individual stocks. Mm -hmm. And just not to get on a too too much of a tangent here, but uh, where, where do you feel like the high frequency you know trading comes into play there? I mean, it, it's certainly. Uh, because there is so much of this trading that's happening where they're just trying to get pennies and you know algorithms are involved. Uh, do, you, do you think that's skewing things as well in terms of sometimes making volume look a little bit higher than maybe? It oh, otherwise? hugely. You look at the biggest volume days um, in the indices, they're always on those big down days. And that's because the spreads widen and that gives the spreads determine the level of high frequency trading commitment to being in the market. Um, and when spreads are wide, guess what? That means liquidity is low. That's not when you necessarily want to be in the market. Um, if you're a day trader and you really uh, can definitely handle that or you see something and it abides by your risk parameters, go for it. But one of the things that concerns me is the secular trend from the upper right to the lower left in terms of liquidity. And that really got its origins in electronic trading in the late 1990s. And it's only trended down since then. And you combine it with um, the Federal Reserve, the macro picture right now, mm -hmm. which is winding down its balance sheet. That means that uh, uh, the big banks aren't holding as many treasuries. Uh, their, ca their capital is constrained uh, for a variety of different reasons, not only in the equities markets, but also in the treasury markets where you don't even necessarily have high frequency trading. We're seeing a lack of liquidity. And so I think that's what's caused some of these outsized movements and some of these really quick movements. You know, you look back in 2020, we had a bear market, which if you blinked and if you were <laughs> concentrating on other things, which you probably should have, you missed it. Yeah. And that's because I, th I think is because prices can move faster when there's not as much liquidity, when you don't have those market maker pools willing to step in and support the price. So that only guarantees, I think, more volatility in the future, making the game a little bit uh, more difficult to play, but also for smarter investors presenting more opportunities. Mm -hmm. And and so the fragmentation, I mean, you, you mentioned that before, and you, you said that you look at kind of the, the composite volume, because certainly, I mean, if you just looked at the volume that was happening on the New York Stock Exchange floor itself, I mean, that's that's a far well, cry from what it used to they're be. They're watching the sure. World Cup. I mean, no offense, but... <laughs> Yeah. So um, and and so, you know, you, you've got that volume component there. Um, you, you've got the fragmentation. Do you think that's one of the things that's that's leading to that lower liquidity um, or is it the fragmentation itself? Because, uh, again, a lot of times, I, you know, you can't do the blocks. It's almost like 100 shares here and there. Yeah. Market micro market microstructure is something I'm interested in only because I, I have never been able to fully wrap my head around it because I've never been able to fully get an answer or a roadmap as to actually how everything fits together mm -hmm. in a, in one piece. Um, you know, we could go on. I could go on, talk about payment for order flow and incentives here and yeah. there. But I, I think th I get back to the 20 year trend. Um, fewer humans intervening more machines intervening uh just means lower liquidity and there's no reason to expect that to return anytime soon the only i it and it's only going to get worse as quantitative tightening uh tightens financial conditions overall uh, that's only going to get worse it'll get better when the fed finally does pivot starts cutting rates or at least eases the brakes off of quantitative tightening 
But that's not until 2023. Nothing like that is going to happen in, in December, probably not at the end of January either. Mm -hmm. Now, when we were kind of having our pre-show, one of the one of the terms you uh, or one of us threw out was self-reliance, um, you know, and, and kind of capturing a lot of the things you were talking about in terms of what you you like to focus on. And you brought mm -hmm. up um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, because, of course, he had the essay uh, self self-reliance. W what, what does that mean to you and, and why is it important for investors? I, th I think, um, you know, I watched I watched retail traders with interest, with great interest, and that whole story evolved over the pandemic. And it's always interesting to see new traders approach the market and to see how they react to different circumstances, both to wins and to losses. And it just highlights for me how it's absolutely critical that we as traders take ownership of our own positions and our wins and losses, regardless of what happens outside of our control. Sometimes you're gonna get bad fills. You can argue with your broker. Um, you, can, you can make mistakes yourself, but you don't want to be looking back on a trade other than you know you have your periodic reviews. You might be looking at things at the end of the day, at the end of the week. You want to learn your lessons, but we can't, we can't wistfully wish that the markets would be another, a different way or say that you know, Goldman Sachs, I would, I, would have, uh, I would have been a billionaire, but the, the market's rigged and I just couldn't make it. You know, there are the, the Fed and the fiscal stimulus, the monetary and fiscal stimulus were incredible tailwinds, which I think will be studied for the rest of the decade. Um, I don't want to say it's a once in a lifetime occurrence because it kind of happened in 2000, it'll probably happen again. Uh, just because the time compression, you know, everything's getting faster and faster, which itself is a symptom of low liquidity. But once in a lifetime happens more frequently. <laughs> yeah. As much as I love to talk about macro and all these other things, at the end of the day, my PL is what counts. Only price yeah. pays. Another phrase uh, a friend of the show here, Brian Shannon, likes to use. Mm -hmm. And so that fits in with this uh, American transcendentalism. We we're talking about Ralph. Waldo Emerson and then Henry David Thoreau. That's what we were talking about before in terms of simplicity. I'm mm -hmm. not a philosopher. Don't write letters. This is just a loose, a loose kind of analogy. But, you know, we were talking about this. Uh, I don't know when it was in the pre-show and tra and transcendental investing seemed like a kind of maybe it could be a thing. I kind of like yeah. it. Well, absolutely. And, and you know, some of these guys were, you know, at times, uh, you know, kind of off in the woods doing their own thing. Literally. You know, that, that, yeah. yeah really. <laughs> um, so and, and, you know, it makes me think of uh, have you ever read the book by uh, Nicholas Darvis, uh, How I Made Two Million in the Stock Market? Um, it's, 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 it's one of the classics. But one of the things is, you know, he was like traveling, you know, as a as a, you know, as a dancer all over the place. And uh, so he was getting the tape reads like so far, you know, removed and he was putting his trades in. Uh, he also referred to like someone that was basically trading in the woods and would hear the news like days afterwards. But, you know, a lot of times it was just what was happening on the tape, what was going on on the chart. And that told him everything he needed to know, basically. And so since you're on the news side, you know, with 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 your show, with what you're doing with uh, Yahoo Finance, what is it that you try and focus on uh, to kind of cut through the noise yourself uh, and, and give the most relevant information there? Um, I, I try to cut through as much noise as possible um, for the viewers of Yahoo Finance. But I mean, sometimes you got to report on stuff that is not that might be news, but not necessarily rev relevant to trading. I do try to make that distinction, but I, I like to say you, you really have to turn the news off sometimes. And mm -hmm. if you're interested in analyzing a stock, um, you know, unless you have a very trusted opinion source and you're aligned with them in terms of your risk management, you got that down or the differences between and uh, your positioning. There's just there's not a lot of reason to just be fixated on the news cycle when there's so much opportunity to dig into the charts and to really understand what's going on outside of the news. So it impresses me that Nicholas was able to do that. And I haven't read the book, by the way was able mm -hmm. to do that as removed as he was. I imagine that's the way a lot of people were back in the day. Yeah, uh, right. Personally, I'm so affixed to the news cycle. I wouldn't want to put on a trade um, without the latest update in price uh, from my broker, you know, looking at my charts a million times. That's just me. Maybe it's a crutch and um, I should take a look at that. Uh, but I do have a lot of respect for, for traders. And I've read about some others who have managed to live what a quote unquote normal life and just trade for a living a few hours a day or a few hours a week right. um, 
in the meantime, I, it's really easy to overtrade. So I, I, I think you'd have to be exceptionally disciplined to do that. So let's say you go on vacation with your family and you got a plan to uh, not look at the market. Well, what happens if there's a huge event and you're suddenly suck, stuck uh, on mm -hmm. that CPI release at 8.30 a.m.? And uh, now you're trading over your vacation. You lose some money, but now you got to get back in. You got to make that up. The, the point is, um, you got to have a lot of discipline to do this, to expect to be able to do this for a living. And mm -hmm. it just, you got to put in the hours. Right. Absolutely. So maybe let's uh, finish this segment with, you know, certainly one of the things that you have to kind of look at um, when, when you're doing this for a living, or even if you're, you know, just trying to make, make money at it is it's, it's kind of your daily habits to a certain degree. I mean, you have to have good habits. You have to, I mean, it's, it's normal for you to flub up every now and then, right? Everyone yeah. does it, but you know, how do you fix those mistakes when you make them? So are there any particular daily habits that you think are most critical for investors? Really about the routine itself. Um, I mm. highly recommend Atomic Habits. Um, I'm, I haven't even finished the book yet, uh, but I've been interested, I've been trying to keep uh, good daily habits for a while that match whatever I'm trying to do. And since I'm not an act, I'm not really an active trader right now, they're going to be a little bit different. But um, I, you know, waking up at the same time, having a routine where you uh, dissociate yourself from the markets a little bit, kind of catch your breath in the morning, then you enter into that, uh, you, you start looking at charts, getting a feel for the market. If you're trading equities, you know, the opening bell at 9.30 a.m. Eastern going to be one of your key pivot times. You're trading Forex, maybe you're waking up at 2 a.m. and trading the euro or the British pound, whatever it is, consistency. Uh, is really key. And then also the analysis. So writing down, keeping a log, a journal of what you're thinking about, what I'm thinking about as I'm looking at different charts, different tickers, entering trades, why I like it, having a plan for exit before that, uh, before that buy lever or buy button is pushed. I think that's critical too. And then just being able to periodically review that, uh, whether you know, you're closing out at the end of the day, or reviewing a, a bunch of trades or whether it's on a weekly basis, just having those systems in place um, and then having also incentives to keep those in, to keep those habits going as well. And that's kind of part of the uh, Atomic Habits book. But, you know, you, you look at some of the trading literature like Mark Douglas trading in the zone. Um, a lot of it is just about being able to enter into a certain state where you're not so emotionally attached. You're never going to be able to divorce yourself from all emotions, but you can enter what's uh, a lot of athletes call flow. And I think that's what we're trying to get to. So whether you're trading in the zone, trading in the flow, flow, you know, like Michael Jordan was able to uh, play basketball in the flow, or whether you're simply uh, keeping these daily habits to be able to center yourself and keep in this flow. I think it's all part of the same game here. And I think we're all kind of talking about the same thing. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times it really, as you said, before it comes down to the discipline and sometimes that means you have to have certain rules that you know you you follow and you just you just don't break them you know because discipline will save us from ourselves and from yeah. us trying to be a genius and you know when we try to be a genius and we start counting those dollars you know we're spending the money on that trade you know it's over you know <laughs> right, it's over. Right. absolutely yeah if, if, if you want an indicator that's almost guaranteed to if let you're you know spending when the top it, is, you might you as start... well just write it off yeah, very good. Okay, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the sectors and the stocks that are on Jared's radar and, you know, where he's seeing some opportunities coming up. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Direction. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Jared Blickery on the other side of the table. He's not the interviewer. He is the interviewee this time. He is a global markets reporter from Yahoo Finance. And so let's let's get into kind of what you're seeing happening in a, a lot of the sectors. And you already mentioned a little bit about what you were seeing in retail. Uh, there's certainly some some winners and losers here. They, they, they are not all created equal. Uh, so talk to talk to us a little bit about why you think that is right now. 
I think um, you, you take a look at retail and some of the biggest components in consumer discretionary, the big, the kahuna is Amazon, and we know what's happened to the mega caps this year. But then on the other side, the brick and mortar, especially looking at some of the discount retailers, uh, TJX is uh, my top pick in this sector, but also Ross. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like Ross stores as well. It simply had an, an earnings beat and they gapped up so much and it's been consolidating. I'm waiting for a moving average to catch up. But you look at TGX here, it's big, been hugging the 20 day. Yeah, there we got Ross a little bit too far too fast. We'll see what happens. TJX hugging the 20 day moving average. It's at all time highs right now. You got that huge rounded base throughout the entire year. So I, I like the potential for this. And I think back to, I was I talked about how I first started uh, following stocks in the wake of the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. I was a member of a trading group um, and we had some can slimmers in there. Lululemon was one of the early leaders. I think it was in 2009, 2010. I'd never heard of it. We didn't have one of those stores in Miami, so I thought it was pronounced Lululemon. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, that was an incredible story for years. Um, yeah. I think it went on to 2017, 18, whatever. Um, so this could be a different retail story, you know? Uh, and that would be really interesting because in this new, are we in a new era of frugality? Well, this might reflect that. And so if, if you're thinking that's going to continue, then this would be, uh, an interesting play along those lines. Yeah, I mean, to that end, I'm re I remember when Lululemon came out and, you know, it got on our radar, the IPO, and it mm -hmm. was, you know, paying $80 for, you know, for athletic wear. That, you know, <laughs> seemed a little, little did we know we would be living in them for two years. But Right, exactly, exactly. But certainly, uh, especially if you're expecting recessionary times uh, or in inflation pressures, um, a lot of times that's where the discount the discount stores do well. I mean, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, you know, TJX, Ross stores. I mean, when you're when you're struggling to kind of you know figure out how you're going to balance your budget, uh, your 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 personal budget, certainly those discounters uh, you know come into play in a big way as 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 recessionary plays. Yeah, and you mentioned some of the dollar plays. I like those too, but there's so much variability with interest with uh, interest rates and inflation that's affecting their margins that they're just getting mm -hmm. squeezed. So I think it's they're going to play a game game of catch up. But I think as the I think as inflation not I think as it subsidizes as it subsides and stabilizes a bit, not necessarily goes away, but even if it just stays at three percent for a while, you'll see some of those dollar plays catch up again as they're able to adjust their margins and execute a little bit better. But in the meantime, TGX, I think, is a great story, um, especially heading into real into your end, because to my knowledge, they well, they don't really have much of an e-commerce platform. Uh, it's <laughs> I, I get offers from them in my in my uh, email box because there happens to be a location near me uh, down in the financial district. And sometimes I shop there. But, you know, for the most part, it is a brick and mortar discount store. So yeah. I just think it's a really interesting contrast to some of the prior high flying names like Lululemon that we had in the prior huge cycle. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, I, I haven't gone into a TJX in quite a while myself, but uh, <laughs> they have the home goods stores, which my wife drags me to a number of times. And, and it's almost like a little bit of a treasure hunt, you know, idea where yes. you, you just you never know what you're going to find. You know, it's, it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, going to look for this very specific thing. It's like you just kind of look around and like, oh, I'm, I'm looking for something like this. And then you kind of see see what you, you come across on the shelves to a certain degree. Yeah, if you ever need to load up on cheap socks, I mean, that's a go-to place too. Yeah, okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the other areas that, again, you, you wouldn't normally expect to be uh, in, a, in a strong market where growth is really, you know, taking off. Um, insurance has been one of those areas that typically doesn't do well in strong rallies, strong market rallies. It tends to do a little bit better, especially on the relative strength side versus the S&P 500, when the market is down. And usually it's because insurance just isn't coming down as much. So maybe we could look at um, Chubb, which uh, the ticker symbol is CB, mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that are maybe going to look at these charts um, afterwards, or if you're watching the video, uh, that's available at www.investors.com slash podcast. Um, talk to me a little bit about Chubb and what you're seeing in the insurance uh, insurance area. All right. So what we're looking at on the screen right there, that looks like it goes back quite a few years. Yeah, so this um, is a weekly chart. On the weekly. Great. If we could drill down to the daily, I'm looking at a cup and handle 
uh, not perfect, but just breaking to the upside literally Wednesday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, so nice formation. So you're kind of looking at this 216 level as your, yeah. your top of the handle there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 216, 217, and it finally broke to the upside. Why, why would insurance be doing well in this environment? Financials in general um, like higher interest rates, but the banks, you know, which is also on the financial side, and that's really what we think of when we talk about financials, banks have been hurt because they're squeezed in different ways. It has to yeah. do with Fed policy and the yield curve and all that. Insurance companies have giant piles of cash that they can invest and earn a rate of interest that is much higher than it was previously just because rates have gone up. So they they are enjoying the benefit of higher rates without having all the regulatory constraints and other constraints that banks have. So that's my story on, on, on uh, insurance stocks and a number of them. It's not just Chubb. Um, I was looking at some others here like Travel, Travelers, um, another ticker, GL, HIG. I haven't even heard of some of these, but a lot of these charts mm -hmm. Uh, are looking good and have broken to the upside or in the decent momentum trends. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned travelers, that's a uh, TRV. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course this is, uh, they, they, they used to be on the, the Dow Jones industrial average, uh, you know, way back yeah, when. Yeah, back in the day. Yeah. So did um, GE. So did yeah, yeah, so did GE, right. right. <laughs> GE was, I think, one of the longest standing components. It was one of the original Dow components. Um, so, you know what, since, since, you, since you brought up GE, I'm just gonna take yeah. another tangent here. Um, because industrials, uh, I mean, you already talked about the strength in the Dow Jones industrial average, mm -hmm. but industrials themselves, uh, you know, that those have seemed like they've been uh, kind of interesting looking. I've just been seeing a lot of these groups uh, showing more strength, whether it's, you know, the machinery or uh, the, you know, general industrial or even, you know, you look at deer and caterpillar and, and some right. of those. Uh, does, does that surprise you when... You know, again, everyone's talking about recession type stuff. And if you think that the economy is going to slow, why do you think the industrials are starting to look a little bit stronger? I think it's what's going to happen with them on the other side. People are retrenching on a lot of R&D and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of investment for growth right now uh, because of the interest rate environment, high inflation that we're seeing. But if we are in a different secular environment, this is probably going to favor cyclicals more because it's not going to be the economy is not going to be predicated on cheap money. The engine of growth will will need to be actual growth in companies, corporations. Um, I think there's a decent chance that we see an industrial uh, recession in Q2, Q3, which leads into a general recession. Uh, but that's I mean that's getting really far out there. Uh, if you could show a chart, so GE is still one of the most widely held, at least it once was, I don't know how it is now, widely held stocks. And I'm not seeing a lot of anything compelling there, but if you go to Boeing, this yeah. was a ticker I almost um, chose here. Uh, on, on the longer term, what you got there, you can see if you were to draw a trend line, there's a negative trend slope there that it was it is just breaking out of or just up against right now. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on how... Yeah, it could either be right there, it could be breaking up. Um, Boeing was the Dow in 2017, huge industrial stock. Um, a lot of it, a lot of it is levered to government spending. Of course, they had the 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 fallout from those plane crashes the, and right. you know, yeah. that whole mess. But Boeing is a huge leader. So on the other side of this, I'm looking to see what Boeing is able to do as a leader of industrials. Um, and also part of, I think, the outperformance that we saw in, in November, it was centered in materials and industrials. A lot of that had to do with the declining dollar. And that's also part of my macro analysis, that if you have a declining dollar, a strongly declining dollar, and that was the biggest decline that we've seen um, probably in a year, uh, probably two years, that, there you go, that's UUP, and that's going to closely track what happens to what we call the Dixie, the DXY. Um, the euro is heavily weighted, probably overweighted, but this gives you a good sense of what the currency, the U.S. dollar is doing. Um, as long as that remains above the 200 day moving average, I'm still on alert for the potential that we're going to have some difficulties with risk markets, with commodities in general. Um, but if it breaks down below that 200 day moving average and UUP is a little bit different technically that I'm looking at than the DXY, but the DXY is right there. If that happens, I think we see a huge Santa Claus rally and we're going to see materials, industrials, probably 
tech is going to follow in there. It's going to be one of those baby in the bathwater rallies. Um, <laughs> and it's going to be limited in scope. So, you know, if you miss it, I wouldn't chase it into the new year. But uh, that's just one of my hypotheses here. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, we talked a little bit about industrials and certainly uh, a lot of people could consider Boeing a little bit more on the defensive side. Um, you know, it, it is aerospace, aerospace defense, but defensive in a different way where, you know, a, a place where people hide their money. Are there other defensive areas that you're you're seeing, um, yeah. again, with the cyclical idea? You know, I like some of the boring staples, uh, several of which are posting returns like their, their growth stocks, uh, 20, 30 percent, some of these names. So uh, GIS, and that is General Mills. This is uh, really outperforming. It's one of the leaders among the staples. And um, I like here now. I'm not seeing it really respect the 20 and the 50 day moving averages. It's more of that trend channel. I mean, you can just see how that thing is probably bumping up against the upper end of a trend channel right now. So I wouldn't be a buyer right here. I'd just be waiting till it comes back down below that 50 day moving average to the bottom end if you were to draw a parallel trend line. So uh, the absolute out for me would be the 200 day. Uh, don't want to see it uh, puncture that. But I think it's I think it's reasonable to have some defense in the current market because uh, people uh, not only are flocking or not only people have to buy these things. And also, this is one of the traditional groups that uh, does a little bit better relative outperform relatively outperforms the market uh, when we have times of trouble. Right now, I guess a, a counter argument here is that sometimes when you uh, focus too much on the defensive side, if you do get kind of growth coming back on then you get this massive sector rotation. And certainly in some of the rallies we saw uh, earlier this year, I mean, I'm thinking back to this this May period where you know you, you expect General Mills and and Hershey's and all of these stocks to just, you know, be less volatile. And they had these huge drops, you know, because there was kind of this sector rotation happening. So what what's your kind of take on when when you get this volatility sometimes in what's supposed to be very mild moving stocks like general mills again it's a staple it's cereal it's uh not supposed to move that much i think that's a symptom of the low liquidity that we've that we have in the right. markets that we've been talking about and that's why uh, i you have to have stops in and respect those stops and you might get some slippage on the way down and you might miss it all together I, I mean you look at some of those gap downs there those are probably earnings gaps and there's not a lot of way to defend against that when there's no pre-guidance. And I hate when companies do that. They just spring that on you at the last minute. But right. there have been so many there have been so many days where there's been almost a complete rethinking about, uh, you know, of positioning in the markets. Institutions cannot switch on a dime. Uh, they yeah. have to make their changes over over weeks. And to be to try to do that in this environment on, you know, Powell has basically set up the CPI report and the monthly employment situation report to be the biggest drivers in the market right now. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of traders hanging on what he says, everybody is glued to these reports. So if they came, if any one of those comes in out of line, you see a massive repositioning by institutional investors. And yes, you can get caught off guard, which means there's really no safe place to be in the market. Uh, yeah. But this is a market that we're given and it uh, gets back to my uh, mantra of you got to own you got to own your results here in this market. And we don't really get to choose uh, that much. So we're, we're stuck with the markets that we have on Earth. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I, I, I was going to close it here, but I, I'm just going to throw this out there because, I mean, energy has been so strong this year. Uh, so I, I, I feel like we can't ignore that. What's yeah. what's your take there? I mean, it's certainly been one of those areas that was underperforming for a long time. Um, what, what What's your take as it's outperformed for most of this year? Um, it, it's heavily tied. So bigger picture, of course, crude oil and the prices of crude oil fuel it, but it has become dissociated from oil prices because right now WTI has been flirting around $75, $77 per barrel. It actually dropped to $73. Um, yeah, this this looking, is, I'm showing the, uh, USO. the USO, which which isn't exactly tracking the West Texas uh, you know, intermediate, yeah. but it kind of gives you, you a what. sense. Yeah, you look at that most recent hammer candle. It looks like a hammer candle there a couple of days ago. That is, if you look at a tw like a ten-year chart of crude, um, whatever low that is, uh, that's probably going to correspond to about the seventy-four, seventy-five dollar price level 
in crude oil. So that's actually not the case there. They got to deal with the U.S. oil role and they're trying to yeah, arbitrage yeah, yeah. play the futures. Uh, but 75 to 125 dollars has been the range in WTI. And as long it's bouncing off the lower end of that. So what does that mean? It means energy could rally from here. But if WTI sinks below 75, starts um, using that as a ceiling, uh, forget about energy for a while. I think uh, that's going to be too much for it to handle because it could probably drop to 65 or $55 uh, barrels per uh, dollars per barrel, which is almost incomprehensible given where we were a few months ago. But I, I, that's just what I'm saying. So energy, I think it's still up 60%, uh, the S&P 500 sector on the year, which is incredible. Uh, but oil prices have been in decline because of demand. As I said, so since WTI is rallying off the bottom into that range, we might see a spike in energy and oil prices into year end. And that's how I'm seeing oil right now. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned a little bit of a disconnect between uh, oil prices and some of the companies. And I, I, I certainly agree with you in that regard, because sometimes the oil prices have been coming down, but some of the companies have been kind of going the opposite way. Yeah, know? and here's another, I was listening to your podcast last week and mm -hmm. it just struck home for me. This is a different market and a lot of traders are not used to playing energy names. If, you wanted, yeah. if you're a Momo trader, who would have thought you're gonna be picking and choosing among natural gas plays? And there, I, this is such a different field for so many investors. You have to learn the particulars, otherwise just stick to the ETF. So, yeah. you know, it's like, I would not start trading biotech tomorrow because I do not know, it's way beyond my competency. So. If I were to play energy, I'd stick to the ETFs or look at one of the majors. I like BP and Total, which is TTE. Both of those have broke above major resistance levels. They seem to be holding. Yeah, some of those big European majors, they're not going to be exciting, but um, that's a nice chart right there. You got mm -hmm. that. Yeah, you got that big bowl and the break above. And as long as that holds, maybe off to the races again. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of a lot of things looking uh, looking interesting in that area. Uh, you know, XLE. You mentioned you know in terms of ETFs. Of course, this has a lot of uh, weighting in in both Exxon Mobil and, and Chevron. Um, but you know, they're a lot of these companies and and ETFs. They're they're right there at new highs, whereas oil is is well off its high, highs. Uh, so very interesting stuff. And uh, Jared, I gotta I gotta say, this has been a great conversation with you. Thank I'm you. so glad that you were willing to to be on the other side here. Uh, it was great learning a little bit more about your background and your thoughts on things. Because uh, man, every time I talk to you, I'm just impressed with your your wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much for sharing that with our listeners. Great to be here with you and everybody else. Thank you. Yeah. And I just want to also mention that uh, for people that want to follow you a little bit more, I mean, where can where can they find you? Uh, I mean, I know you have a, yes. uh, an active Twitter handle. Uh, that's yes, for the, time, for the time being, as long as Twitter is alive and kicking, come on, <laughs> Elon, I'm at Spy Jared, at Spy Jared. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, after the uh, Spider S&P 500 ETF. Wonderful. So, yeah, definitely check out uh, the, the the Twitter handle there. And um, how often are you uh, doing your show on, on Yahoo Finance? Is there well, a video place that people can go there or is, is Twitter the best place? Twitter is probably the best place. I'm on every day. I usually cover the opening and closing bells. I guest anchor, but I also have a show called Yahoo Finance Uncut, which we're just getting off the ground this year. Um, no fixed schedule on that. You've been, you and Irusha have been guests there. Very mm -hmm. appreciative of that. Uh, but check us out. We got a great YouTube channel. You can find us on the yahoofinance.com site. And uh, we got big, big plans for the new year as well. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for being here, Jared. Really appreciate it. Okay. And next week, we're going to have Scott Bennett returning to the show. He's the uh, Investing with Rules founder and CEO. Uh, he talks a lot about what the funds are getting into and looking at trends there. So it'll be great to have him back on the show. Thank you so much for joining us this week, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.